This is a Living a Creative Life video for Opus, featuring Beam Paints, an indigenous-owned, female-led company built from a multi-generational love of pigment, paint, color, and innovation. With a strong emphasis on high-quality pigment content and eco-friendly packaging, Beam Paints offers truly sublime and unique artist materials. In today's episode, we have the pleasure of hearing from artist and founder Anong Beam, her journey is truly inspiring. As a single mother of two, she faced challenging circumstances that compelled her to seek a deeper connection between her sons and the teachings she received as a child. This pursuit led to personal transformation and the birth of Beam. Building on her early education in indigenous pigment, Anong has expanded her vision to encompass diverse paint traditions. In her own words, she shares her captivating, living a creative life story. My name is Anang Nigwant Beam, and I'm a painter, a mother, a curator, just general enthusiast of all things paint and art related. And I'm the founder of Beam Paints. And we're here in Cheating First Nation in uh, Manitoulin Island, Ontario. So we are on the largest freshwater island in, in the world. And we're in the middle of Lake Huron and people come onto the island by a little swinging bridge. It's a really magical place to be. And this is where my family has been from. So our workshops and where we collect our materials for paints and packaging all comes from uh, land that was that we were signatories of the Robinson Huron uh, Treaty for. So I'm the current caretaker of many generations of our family and on this, this place. We are indigenous manufacturers of plastic free art supplies, specifically watercolor, but uh, increasing into other, other paints and coatings as our enthusiasm and energy allows. We source, uh, some of all of the paints locally and we in kind of what makes the bean paints unique uh, as a paint is that we make we use all kinds of, of pigments and i use synthetic pigments and sometimes this gets me into people get cross with me that they think everything should be right from the earth and whilst as an earth gathering pigment gathering person, I, I love them. You also have to understand the pigment history of the greater world to know that the majority of earth derived vivid colors are really toxic. And my father passed away early. And when he was ill uh, at the end, he had to have a blood chelation therapy and they his blood was really heavy with heavy metals. And partially that's because of his traditional diet from as a young person eating a lot of, a lot of fish, but really I, I suspect the art supplies he used because artists don't really understand. I don't feel, I don't feel that education is sufficient. Uh, at least it wasn't when I went through for the hazards of art supplies. So you can have cadmium, heavy metals, cobalt, and he had all of those colors. He used those. He also did printmaking and etching and photography, all really chemical heavy uh, things. So when I started making paint, I knew I don't want to just make the best hand gathered paint. Like I want to make the best paint in the world. And because if, if everything is at our are all of these ways of knowing are at our our disposal, then we should put our best foot forward. Really early on, we joined the Art and Creative Materials Institute. Everything that we gather and everything that we source goes through a third party toxicology or program to become a Beam Paints product. And I'm really proud of that because it takes a long time in Western society, there's a notion that Earth 
oh, anything from the earth, earth mother, and we need to go back to the earth. And while it's very good hearted and the intentions are in the right place, I think that the an indigenous worldview of understanding the earth is understanding the power of the earth and that we need to be respectful and that we need to be wary because it is it, it's there are plants with great power, there's minerals with great power, and we have to conduct ourselves accordingly. I was making paint for my own practice and I had done that for quite a few years because I learned that from my my parents and I think it was I really started going to making it in depth more purposefully um, at a time after a lot of personal uh, transformation and tough circumstances. I was a single mother with two kids at the time. And I really wanted to connect with my own uh, teachings I had had from my family, from my dad who passed away years before and didn't get to meet my sons. So I was taking them out and they were the same age that I was when I learned those things. And I was taking them to rock quarries and gathering rocks and doing teaching them things like that. And really that's what everything came out of. Uh, I started sharing pictures of it on Instagram and people were really interested. And then I started thinking, how, how can I make it to share with other people? So the paint stones were born out of that because my father would collect uh, pigment and he kept them in bags and that's what he called them. They literally are paint stones. The Ojibwe language is very descriptive. So if you have sto these stones and you file them down to make paint, then they're paint stones. And um, he would go collecting in the Lacloche mountain range and uh, all over the place. He was always on the lookout for different places. So different sites where you might find uh, a beautiful pigment. And he was also a professional artist. He was the first artist of Indigenous ancestry in Canada to be purchased by the National Gallery of Canada as contemporary art. And that's really, really shaped things for me because before him, all art by Indigenous people was in Canada was regarded as uh, ethnographic. And that came from a salvage paradigm of imagining that this is a disappearing culture and that anthropologically it had to be studied and uh, recorded for, for posterity. And his work was really heavily about placing Indigenous people in the now and celebrating and recognizing our current issues. So that affected my paint practice in the, insofar that uh, it's easy to relegate Indigenous knowledge to uh, past historical, but I think what Beam Paints does really well that I'm really proud of is taking an Indigenous viewpoint, a Anishinaabek viewpoint of, of the world and uh, responsibilities with the earth and the people we share it with, and looking at how can we achieve that with modern materials and practices. I, I had been really, really active as an artist for a long time before the business. So it just kind of was something that I didn't really explain. I think other people connected the dots and said, so do you use your own paints? And I thought, well, yeah, yeah, I do. It's how it kind of came to be. As our range grows and the ability to create light fast, professional colors in different tonalities. And as my skill as a paint maker grew, I think uh, it definitely affects the paintings. Oh, I can see the first ones I did after, they were really bright, they're so vivid. There's so many colors. And I had spent a bit of time away from painting before that because I was pretty busy moving house and doing a lot of other life, life shifts. And then when I came back to painting, it was just a, a real riot of color. 
And it also makes me think, I think a lot because I, for me, it, as an artist, when I was younger, pigments and paint were like the gold or the currency of the house. I was so aware of the, the worth and value of paint and pigments and the cost because at different points through my young life and my adult life, I was incredibly uh, impoverished. So to get the money together to buy a tube of Windsor and Newton cadmium yellow watercolor, you know, those, those paints were really, really pricey. So my parents really valued them and treasured them. You come to realize as a paint maker that uh, a lot of what we consider an artist's particular palette is really gets def defined by their, their limitations, especially looking back at historical artists, because somebody like Vincent van Gogh with his really heavy use of Naples yellow and those kinds of colors we associate with him, he would have been dealing with the limitations of what colors the color man brought by because they were mixing their own colors. They didn't have access to every color under the sun the way that we do now. So myself, I didn't have limitations on pigments because of the lack of access geographically. It was more the lack of access financially. And a lot of the colors that I used before and that my parents used were came from handed down paints and gathered paints. So being able to make any color definitely makes all of the choices that much more uh, myriad. I'm grateful to modern technology for developing to the point where it is now that this has allowed me to stay in my home community. And before pre-internet and pre all of these uh, systems that connect us to the larger global marketplace, there's no way that I could have done this business or had this, uh, this company in the way that it is now. I get to be in my home community, which means that I started a business where I had supports and I had my mother down the street and that made it possible. I had, I had a really neat experience once of um, going out in a boat on the North Channel and in between uh, the island and the North, uh, the North Shore and visiting islands and collecting rocks, different places, coming back to my workshop and I was making paint for them. And then I started painting some of the places that we had been where those rocks had come from. So I was painting that rock and then I realized, oh, I'm painting this rock with paint made from that rock. Uh, that was really cool. You know, I hope that from the perspective of a viewer of one of my paintings, that they would feel something of a connection to the place that they're seeing in the painting. And that's why I paint them, because they're recollections of places and people and times that are special to me. Even if those people, places and times never coexisted at the same moment, I, it's fun for me to bring them together in paintings. We're, we're steadfastly uh, committed to watercolor as our, our main our main paint that we're making and we're, we're going to bring on more colors steadily as we bring them through our approvals process um, but we are looking forward to uh, bringing out some oil paints and those will be uh, the same the same quality of pigments the same attention to ingredients uh, and the same hand attention hand attention that they they'll be they should be really good that's what i've been using for these years and i i did feel a little bit selfish that i'm painting away with them and not sharing them so but it took a long time to develop that uh, as a shareable paint because we were trying to source uh, a container that would be meet our 
standards. And that was pretty difficult. We ended up getting an entirely, it's beautiful and they, they haven't arrived yet, but they're coming these um, fully collapsible aluminum tubes. And the cap of the tube is also solid aluminum. So the whole thing, when you're done, you go into the recycle bin. And aluminum can be endlessly reformed and recycled. I'm the main uh, paint adventurer. And uh, I'm really, really blessed to have been able to develop a great team that handles a lot of the day-to-day -day aspects. I have a great paint maker that I work with. Uh, CC and she comes from Sagamuk First Nation and she's a wonderful paint maker, uh, a junior paint maker. She's getting there and she makes a, a lot of really great paint for us. And um, it's been really neat to be able to expand that kind of knowledge in our, in our community. And it has given me enough time to focus on uh, developing other other paint ideas and that's really what led to our the patent that we have pending and a few we have a few industrial design patents as well based on different approaches to presenting uh, paint and wrapping watercolor paint so that definitely has been uh, is one of my favorite things to do we work with heavy industry in a partnership because we're not just randomly digging holes that people might fall in later. And I think that's something important to, to relate as well, that um, harvesting natural pigments, especially in, in quantity, you don't want to be stripping, uh, you don't want to be taking away from the landscape. We actually get quite a lot of different colors when people are excavating at different points to uh, erect buildings because the heavy machinery can go so deep into the substrata of the, the earth that you really see the layerings of different clays and earths. And that's a really uh, great time for us to collect what we, what we need for our processes. And then they go on about the, their business. So then we've, we've made the best of a, a situation. And also with quarries, we collect uh, pigments and stone from different indigenous quarries and non-indigenous quarries on Manitoulin Island where they're cutting stone. And a lot of the, the super fines that come from these quarries is a, it's a hazard to them. So we're able to remove that where it would have been waste stream and it would have been dispersed as a as a hazard where we can collect it and re reuse it in in uh, give it a second life in a paint it took me a long time to realize that i knew how to make paint it sounds ridiculous as somebody who had been in it the way that i have been my whole life but when you learn something, I think in a traditional fashion, uh, we live in a, in a time that really privileges uh, a Western uh, process to education, which would have you attend a certain institution and then receive a certificate. And then, then there you go. You need a driver's license, well, you have to take this test and then you'll be certified. And that never happened for me even though I did go to art school, but uh, it took a, a long time for me to understand uh, that I knew what I was doing and that it was actually, I, I could make paint in, in this way. We hope you've enjoyed this Creative Life video on Anong and Beam Paints. Here at Opus, we continue to be committed to sharing life stories of members within our Creative Life community. You'll find today's episode and many more in our Living the Creative Life resource library. And be sure to tune in next month, where we'll be joined by Emmett Sparling, a talented travel and adventure photographer and videographer. He'll be sharing his own experiences and perspectives on living a creative life on the move.